the River Dower is only five miles long from source to mouth. Yet at one time, during the 19th century, there were about a dozen mills in operation along its length. Only Crabble Mill remains in anything like its original condition. It is one of the most sophisticated and automated water-powered mills to have survived the Industrial Revolution. It was built in 1812, when thousands of extra troops were stationed in the Dover area, in readiness to meet Napoleon's threatened invasion. The local mills could not cope with the extra work. Huge amounts of flour were required to make bread for the troops. Horses and livestock had to be fed. It was decided that the only way to meet the needs of such an army was to build four large water mills. And they were all built along the small River Dower, which was the only river for miles around Dover. The smaller mill with the dark roof was demolished soon after Crabble Mill was built, but the remains of its mill race can still be seen on the ground floor. A mill has probably occupied this site for centuries. Crabble Mill was built here to take advantage of the existing mill pond, which only had to be enlarged. There is enough water in this pond to keep the water wheel on the mill turning for many hours. The flow of water from the pond can be regulated. If more water is released, then the wheel will turn faster. If the river fills up the pond with too much water, a surplus spills over the dam to escape downstream. There was only a narrow space for a weir because the mill had been built so close to the corn drying kilns. For this reason, they built the weir W-shaped, so there would be a gentle flow over a longer edge, even though the gap was only a few metres wide. Also, they had two sluice gates to cope with very large volumes of water coming down the river after heavy rain. Every so often, they would open the gates right up so the sudden rush of water cleaned the mud and debris from the bottom of the pond. You might think that the mill should be organised so that the grain started at the top and fell down from one process to the next. But there are so many processes before grain is turned into flour that to pile them one on top of another would turn Crabble Mill into a skyscraper. Machinery driven by the water wheel does carry grain up to the top floor to start with. It is tipped into a hopper. A belt-driven conveyor lifts it up again to be cleaned. It falls down the chute to the millstones. And then conveyors lift the whole mill flour up to the separating machines. This constant up and down motion, utilising the pull of gravity and the power of water, is the key to understanding how the mill works and why it is laid out in an apparently confused and crowded jumble. The grinding and grading process was almost entirely automatic. The miller didn't have to touch the grain or flour until he banked it on the first floor. But all the machinery is worked by the water wheel which is still at the moment because a board in front of it is holding back the water. To start the mill working, the miller turns this handle on the first floor. This lowers the board and allows the water to flow onto the paddles. Inside, 
the gear is locked in position. Now the weight of water in the paddles drags the water wheel round. The water flows away downstream under the trees. This is called the tail race and a few meters further on it joins the water from the overflow weir. The wheel is stopped by raising the board. Crabble Mill has a breast shot water wheel. The water hits it about halfway up. A 19th century advertisement inside the mill illustrates an overshot water wheel which receives the water at the top. This is the most efficient type of wheel. When the water flows under the wheel, it is called undershot. The heavy iron axle of the water wheel carries the power inside the mill to drive the machinery. On the other side of the axle is the pit wheel, which meshes with the horizontal wallower. The wallower is fixed to the main vertical shaft, which revolves on a huge bearing. The shaft runs up through the mill, carrying power to all the different machines on the floors above. The mill runs so quietly because each iron wheel meshes with a wooden toothed wheel. The wooden teeth wear out, but are easily replaced. That is why the wheel on the left looks almost new. A horse and cart would deliver the corn, that is wheat, barley, oats or rye. If the corn arrived damp, it was first dried in the kiln house next to the mill. The grain was spread out over the floor, which was made of these tiles with tiny holes in. Hot air from fires lit underneath rose through the holes and dried the grain. It would be really hard heaving up this heavy sack and chain by hand. But in fact, it is the water wheel doing all the work. All the miller has to do to raise the sack of corn is pull this control rope. To stop the hoist, he let it go. The rope is attached through pulleys fixed on the ceiling to the end of a wooden beam. The beam is balanced on a fulcrum, so that as one end is raised by pulling the rope, the other end goes down. The hoist drum is fixed on one side of the beam and goes up and down with it. There are two hoists, one outside and one inside. Power comes from the floor below. Normally the leather belts hang loose, but when the beam above is raised, it pulls the belt tight and starts the hoist turning on the top floor. Having hoisted the grain to the top floor, the miller empties the bags down this hatch, where it falls to the dirty grain store. The wire grill catches bits of straw, twigs and leaves mixed up with the grain. 
From here, a vertical conveyor belt carries grain back up to the top floor in its metal cups, which tip it into the corn cleaner. Corn has to be cleaned, for it may be covered in a poisonous mold called smut. The Eureka smut machine separates the smut from the corn. Inside the machine, a fan and a drum are driven round by a leather belt. The grain pours in from above, into the spinning drum, which loosens up all the dirt and mould. The fan sucks up air through the grain and carries the light dust and smut up through the top of the machine into a wooden tube. The wooden tube carries it away. Originally, it continued down the side of the mill and under the water. While the lighter smut is sucked up, the heavier grain falls down a chute to the clean corn store. To stop the fan sucking up corn as well, there are air vents on the side of the machine, which can be opened if the suction gets too powerful. The cleaned corn fell down to the store two floors below. This store is called an arc because it has a sloping floor that allows the grain to flow easily down to the millstones on the floor below. The stone room is on the second floor. There are five pairs of millstones, each covered by a wooden case or tun. The lower stone is called a bed stone and is fixed in the floor and does not move. Only the upper running stone moves. It is turned by a drive shaft which passes through the centre of the bedstone. The shaft locks onto a metal fixture built into the running stone. So as the shaft turns, the stone revolves. The stones used at Crabble are of a very fine quality. Pieces of quartz were cemented together and bound in an iron hoop. They were called French burr stones. The stones often had to be lifted apart, so the pattern of grooves could be sharpened up with a chisel. This portable winch was used to lift them. The tun stops the ground flour flying out all over the mill. The framework on top is called a horse. It holds a bin into which the corn falls from the store above. A shoe under the horse feeds the corn in a steady trickle into the centre of the stones and an iron spindle which turns round with the running stone knocks the shoe to keep the grain flowing. The noise sounds like chattering so the spindle was called the miller's damsel. The shoe is held against the damsel by a string attached to a springy piece of wood. The miller could adjust the flow of corn from downstairs on the first floor with another string which runs up over the tun and lifts or lowers the shoe. If the bin runs out of corn, a bell warns the miller that the stones will soon run dry which could cause dangerous sparks. As the running stone turned, centrifugal force pushed the flour to the edge and a brush set in the side of the running stone swept the wholemeal flour into a chute. The speed of all the machines was controlled solely by the speed of the water wheel. A problem arose when the wheel was just starting up or slowing down to stop. At slow speeds, the corn flow would stop while the millstones were still turning. To avoid them running dry, a governor kept the stones wide apart at this critical stage. It worked like this. A belt attached to the main drive shaft runs a set of governor balls. As the speed of the water wheel builds up, the heavy iron balls spin round faster and fly out with centrifugal force. This lifts a lever, which presses on other levers. These are connected to the running stone which is gently lowered onto the bedstone.
the miller adjusts the gap between the stones by using the stone adjusting screw. This is how the governor solves the problem of when the mill starts or stops. At slow speed, the balls are closed together, holding the lever down and lifting the runner stone a safe distance above the bed stone. Two sets of governors operate all five stones, but a third and much larger set adjusts the speed of the water wheel itself by automatically raising or lowering the board in front. These white tubes are part of another safety precaution. They drew the dangerous and unhealthy dust produced by grinding corn away from the stones and took it to the sealed dust room upstairs. A powerful fan blew the dust inside into a wooden cage, which was originally covered in hessian. Every few days the miller came in and swept up the dust. To stop the fan sucking flour from the stones as well, a flap on the tun could be opened to reduce the suction. There was a string on the flap that's now missing, so that it could be adjusted by turning this knob on the first floor. Wholemeal flour fell down the slanting chute from each pair of millstones working on the floor above. Here, the miller could feel the flour to check its quality. An auger or screw conveyor collected the flour from all five chutes around the wheelhouse and carried it to a vertical conveyor, which takes it up to the third floor. At this stage, the flour contains all the parts of the grain shown in this cross section. To produce white flour, which is really the endosperm, the miller had to remove the bran, which are the outer skins, and the wheat germ, which is the bit that would grow if the grain were planted. All three are mixed together in the wholemeal flour that is conveyed upstairs. Here, a large rotary sieve, called a bolter, separated the white flour from the bits of bran and wheat germ. Originally, the whole bolter was covered in this fine silk, Wholemeal flour is poured in at the top and, as it is tossed around in the rotating sieve, the finer white flour is flung through the silk mesh, leaving the coarser bran inside. A screw conveyor runs along the bottom to take the white flour away to a store below. Meanwhile, the flakes of bran gradually work down inside to the lower end, eventually falling into rotating scoops. but there is still a lot of white flour adhering to the bran. So a vertical conveyor tipped it into a bran cleaner, which was used to brush and spin the valuable white flour out. The outer case has been removed to show the brushes. The machine isn't in working order. The extra flour brushed out of the bran was taken by screw conveyor and dropped down onto the piles of white flour already in the stores below. The bran is now separated by a bran shaker into three grades. The bran shaker is a box which originally had two sieves fixed in it. The sieves have long since gone. The whole box is shaken back and forth and from side to side by an ingenious drive mounted off centre. Only the biggest bits of bran were caught by the first coarse sieve, which had quite large holes. These bits were shaken down the coarse bran chute. The lower sieve, with medium-sized holes, caught the medium bran, which fell down to its own chute. The finest bran fell through both sieves and down a third chute, to the first floor, where all three grades of bran were put into separate bags. White flour was shoveled through a hole in the storeroom floor so that it too could be bagged. 
As the flower fell down the cloth chute into the sacks, the weight was checked using the scales hanging from the ceiling. As you follow the journey of the corn through the confusing jumble of machines packed into Crabble Mill, you begin to realize what a clever labor-saving design it really is. The first floor of the mill is rather like the bridge of a ship. The miller spent much of his day here in what is really the nerve center of the mill. From here, he could control nearly every process in the building. The only fire in the mill was on this floor. A big mill like Crabble probably employed two boys to help the miller. The boys were not necessarily very young. They were apprentice millers learning their trade. They would have done the laboring work, like loading sacks. A horse and cart would deliver the flour and bran to local customers or take it to Dover Harbour, where it could be shipped to London. Crabble Mill worked from 1812 to 1890. It used minimum manpower, and the machinery was driven by a small river. Nothing was wasted. They even swept up the spilt flour and put it into this hopper, which fed it back into the mill. Crabble Mill was as efficient as a water mill could be but it stopped working because people wanted a finer, whiter flour than it could produce. All the machinery turned at a slow, dignified pace. It could not be adapted to produce flour more quickly. The stones were designed to turn at about 130 revolutions per minute. Above a certain speed, the corn would not be properly ground but it was only possible to produce finer white flour with fast-moving steel rollers driven by steam turbines. These were installed further downstream in Buckland Mill, which was owned by the same family as Crabble. Soon, Crabble Mill was shut down because Buckland was supplying all their flour requirements. Fortunately, basic maintenance work was carried out on the building, which remained fairly sound. In 1972, it was restored to almost complete working condition. And in 1984, further major work was carried out. Crabble Mill stands as a working example of the successful exploitation of water power. <laughs>